these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain and rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. All right. Um... Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of the Just Law Podcast. I'm your host of today's episode, Johanna Plazier, and I have the distinct pleasure to be joined by the dean of our very own law school, Dean Vincent Rougeau, along with our newly appointed director of diversity, equity, and inclusion, Director Lisa, La- Lisa Brothwaite. Uh, dean, director, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I know that uh, student engagement with the pandemic may have shifted a little bit. So I know uh, I'm definitely excited. And my fellow 1Ls are definitely excited to get to know you both better. So uh, today is Thursday, March 4th. Um, it's the first Thursday after the end of Black History Month, but it seems like the fun at Boston College doesn't seem to end, uh, seeing as this is the first Thursday of Diversity Month, which is great. Um, So on that note, uh, Director Brathwaite, you just joined us recently in December. Um, So I'm wondering what you and the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Committee have been focusing on since you joining us uh, last December. It's a great question. We have been busy at work. Well, for me, first getting my legs under me, getting to know the community, and has been, I must say, a very welcoming and, and warm community to join. So that has been a great highlight for me. And then we, I've also been working very closely with the uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Working Group. We've had a number of initiatives off the ground already. We um, work with the faculty to complete the IDI. So that is done and we're working with the Office of Inter- Institutional Diversity at the university level to really get the trainings going for them. We have some additional trainings in the work works. So we're really um, trying to focus on some of the um, points that were recommended that we take under our belt and really run with them. I've also been working with the LSA's DEI committee, um, bringing Professor Yoshino to campus for the very, very great covering talk that we had um, last week, which was wonderful. Um, I think it was very timely also, um, as we think about where we are in this particular political climate. Um, I've also been working with Lahanas to support them in their different initiatives and also some various conversations about what the structure looks like and possible changes or iterations to it going forward. So it's been a busy couple of months, but all, all great things that were happening. Sounds like it, uh, which is great. I'm glad you got into the position and just immediately got to work. Um, and I will say, uh, I've only been at the law school, it's a teensy bit time uh, more than you, but I've seen, I tuned into the talk uh, and it was great. And as you said, extremely timely, uh, especially considering that uh, race relations have taken a spotlight with uh, the protests of last summer or the insurrection in January where a Confederate flag was shown for the first time or even the racially charged um, hate crimes against Asian Americans since the onslaught of the pandemic um, on our country. So my first question is directed to you, Dean Rougeau. Um, ha- are these events surprising to you, both as a lawyer and a person of color residing in the United States? Well, uh, I will say that the the insurrection and the storming at the Capitol was surprising to me. I I don't think I ever imagined seeing something like that happen uh, in this country in that way. Uh, And it was really deeply disturbing and and, and frightening to me to see. Um, I was watching the television. I was watching it in real time with my kids because we were uh, wanted to watch the uh, the uh, certification of the election results. And then to see that happen during that, uh, you know, what is normally a relatively, uh, you know, procedural event uh, was, was, was deeply upsetting to me. Now, to the other part of your question, as a person of color, am I surprised that this kind of hatred and vitriol and antagonism uh, came out in this country? Well, unfortunately, no, I'm not surprised. I know that that's always been uh, embedded in our culture. Uh, I think uh, I probably thought that it was a little more contained, uh, a little more uh, repressed, but clearly over the last four years, um, it's been unleashed in ways that have consistently surprised us and terrified us and uh, shamed us as a nation. Uh, so, uh, but to see it escalate to the point where our capital was taken over by you know, a mob, uh, was, was deeply, deeply disturbing. And to now see, to your 
other part of your question about lawyers, uh, lawyers who even during the event tried to pretend that what was happening wasn't happening. And now after the event are trying to apologize for, justify, or pretend again, it didn't happen uh, is sickening. So, uh, you know, it's, it is a time of real uh, distress uh, for all of us in, in many ways when we see that, but I'm also hopeful that there are more people of goodwill who are trying to make sure that this never happens again. Absolutely. Um, I will, you said it, you summarized it very uh, quaintly that it was definitely abhorrent, um, all these events. And it's surprising to see that uh, leaders in the legal community, which should understand the legal implications of events like this happening within our country, um, not even outside of the social scope, or refusing to recognize it. But as you said, uh, we are in a place where we can grow, um, which leads to my next question to you, Director Brathwaite. Um, as our director of DEI, is there anything that you've noticed specifically with these events that you've wanted to change or any initi initiatives that you want to undertake as a result of these uh, recent events? For me, the, the thing that I think is um, most important is for us to understand First, that there needs to be a level of respect um, just as human beings and especially as members of the community that we're engaging and interacting in a, a very common space. So I think that that's the first thing. And I think that respect is definitely resident within this community, which is, you know, I think a, a solid place for us to start from. I think the other thing would be to have more honest and open conversations. Um, I, you know, I referenced Professor Yoshino's talk because I think it was timely and that it also included um, a group that's often forgotten in terms of, you know, white men being included as part of the, the conversation around covering, which I think is so important for us to think about um, because often people who identify as white are seen as other um, and being, you know, quote unquote, the problem. But I think it's, it causes us to look a little bit more deeply at who we are as individuals and realize that there are, you know, there are places of power resident in all of our identities and really understanding that there's room for others to be brought to the table and introduced to the conversation so that we can better understand each other. And then along those lines, then we can have honest and transparent conversations where we can build allyship and really try to create a community that is um, not tolerant, but accepting and engaging for all members. Of it. Absolutely, 100%. Um, I really like, we all do come from places of power, most definitely. And I think it is with all the distinction between race recently, which ultimately just boils down to us being people. Ultimately, it just, it's good to see that there is an initiative to, for us to all be on the same page, most definitely. It's especially needed um, after the tumultuous couple of years we've had in this country. Um, which leads me to my next question. Uh, while you were on that topic, um, you say that the importance with us uh, all being on the same page and all coming from a place of power. Um, it seems like uh, it's kind of difficult as a non-person of color from what I've heard from my friends um, to try to reconcile with like, and to provide support to people of color. So um, what can a non-person of color do to be supportive uh, during these times um, or of healing uh, for our country and our community? I think the first thing really is to acknowledge when things are not going well. Um, and, and in those spaces that you occupy to really take a moment and interrupt some of the narrative that's happening in those spaces. Um, because it, it may be a place where the person who's a person of color feels marginalized or attacked. So as a person who does not identify as a member of that particular community, I think it's really important for you to interrupt the language, um, insert yourself, try to redirect the conversation if possible um, and try to, um, I guess I would say, uh, quench some of the, the language that may be um, inflaming the moment. Um, I think it's also important for you to let BIPOC, Black Indigenous people of color know that you see certain things happening, let them know that there is a space for their voices to be heard and know that you want them to speak. You don't wanna speak on their behalf because I think it's really important for us to realize that each group is going to be supported in a different way. And we want to hear exactly from them how it is that they want to be supported. Um, and I think the other thing you can do in doing those things is also to just become an ally, be supportive of them in the ways that they want to be supported, speak highly of them in places that they don't have access to. 
and really understand that it is about community and it's about changing relationships so that you have that moment where you're able to connect with someone who you may identify as and speak to them about different perspectives that they may not be exposed to as a member of our community um, and really challenge them to think about why they hold certain perspectives and, and think about the ways in which they can then disrupt different um, scenarios in their spaces as well as they take that out of our community and into the world at large. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the importance of perspective and experience cannot be underscored anymore, um, especially considering that's what pretty much uh, that's what pretty much defines who you are and what you bring to the table, most definitely. Um, so it seems like the events of last year have really shown the importance of diversity on in all fields, but not just uh, the legal field, but professional, academic, and trade otherwise, um, which has led me to notice that the legal field has a stark lack of diversity, um, specifically with African-American and other Black individuals um, in the field. So Dean Rizzo, um, I know for sure that if times are tough for me in 2021 as a law student, um, for you when you were in law school a couple of years ago, uh, there must have been even more dire. Um, how did you cope with this when you were in law school? Well, it's remarkable to me that um, you know things have changed as slowly uh, in that space as they have, particularly in the, you know, the space of big law, law firms. Uh, I do feel in law school, the environment um, diverse, was, was more diverse uh, than what I found in the profession. So it was a little shocking to go from law school to the profession um, to find that you were often in, in spaces where there were very, very few people of color. And um, so that was that was hard because I think there had been a lot of work done in the academic environment to at least improve things to get the numbers up. There was still much more work to be done as we're still doing now to make people feel really meaningfully included and part of the community. But you know, at least it had begun. Uh, and what we would encounter, I think, often on the job was uh, what many students still talk about that that's that sense of uh, almost, almost like an imposter syndrome, despite the fact that you had done everything that you were supposed to do to get there, there was really very few places for you to turn to get uh, advice, uh, to find mentorship, uh, to share your fears, because the last thing you wanted to do was to present your, yourself uh, in any way that might suggest weakness. That can be really, really destabilizing when you're trying to uh, to build a career, to uh, engage in a profession, to you know make the kind of connections and to learn the kinds of things you need to know to be to be a great lawyer. So, I understand very intimately what I think a lot of students are facing in terms of their feeling when they go out into into the profession that there's just a lot of difficulty. It's very difficult to succeed because it hasn't changed that much. I mean, you would think after 30 years it would have changed more, but uh, but I do think something that has changed is the level of awareness. I think people are much more aware of where we've fallen short and what we need to do to improve, uh, and more people are focused on making it better. So uh, that gives me some hope that you know we'll start to see real improvement in the years ahead. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Director Brothwaite, so Dean Rujo mentioned that although things have changed in the community slowly, um, it seems like awareness has been a major driving factor of that change. Is that something that you've noticed, not only in your current position at BC, um, but in your previous roles? I would, I would have to agree that I think it is awareness. Um, I think back to when I started as a recruiter um, and there definitely wasn't the same conversation. I think there was always a conversation of wanting to diversify the applicant pool, um, diversify the students that we were hiring as summer associates. But I think that the conscious focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion right now is changing the market. Um, I think, especially in the Boston community, where we have so many law schools here, but we're struggling to retain diverse talent within our firms. I think that's an ongoing conversation. And, and I think, you know, with some of the measures that have been taken, the initiatives like move the needle, the challenge has, has gone out. And I think firms are really trying to rise to the occasion at this point and really understanding that we need to have a legal community that reflects the diversity of our city and of our law schools here. 
So I think, you know, the focus right now, I think in this moment, in the wake of everything that's happened in 2020 after the George Floyd murder, I think it has really, I think the moment has come where we realize that we can't turn back. Um, we can no longer maintain the status quo, but we have to move forward. And I think we've come to the point that change is, is here. Um, I'm optimistic that change will continue to, to happen um, and that it will be sustained across decades to come. Absolutely. Um, extremely heartwarming sentiments, uh, Director Brothway. I really do. I am optimistic um, <laughs> that the legal field will change. Uh, and it's honestly us that needs to drive the change, um, us being people of color, uh, which leads me to my next question. Um, I'll start with you first, Dean Rujo. So was your decision to become a leader within the legal community guided by the lack of diversity within the community? That's a great question. I, you know, I, I don't think I went into what I, what I do now as an academic or what I, what I, when I decided to become a professor, thinking I would be a leader. Uh, you know, I thought I just wanted to really do my job well and to, uh, you know, do my scholarship and my teaching uh, as best as I possibly could do. But I, I think as I became more mature in my in that role, I, I did realize that you know. I have a position here. I have extraordinary influence on uh, people who will be going out and uh, becoming members of this profession. Uh, and um, you know, oftentimes, particularly earlier in my career, I was one of the few professors of color, sometimes the only professor of color any of them had ever had. Uh, and so the, uh, that I think did signal something in my mind over time that. Uh, you know, I can I can have an impact, an even greater impact beyond the classroom and beyond just doing my scholarship if I move into administration. And uh, because then I have sort of, you know, a broader range of areas that I would be touching where I would be engaging. And as I did that, I did see how that impact could be felt. So yes, I mean, it felt really important to me as I engaged in more leadership work that being, you know, a black male in a profession that you know has relatively few black men who are in positions of authority or leadership, although it has been improving, um, was important and um, you know was something that I needed to uh, be very attentive to in the work that I did. Uh, but for all kinds of reasons, not just to say, hey, you know, we can do this too, but also to say to people of all backgrounds, all colors. Look at the richness that comes to an institution when people of varying backgrounds are allowed to be in positions of leadership to demonstrate the gifts and talents that they have and the ways that they can make change happen, they can improve things, and they can sort of, you know, enrich the mission uh, of the institutions that we lead. So, you know, it's something that evolves, I think, as you as you go through your career and you start seeing what, what, what can be accomplished. Uh, and, you know, it's given me uh, an opportunity to do some things that I hope have, have, have helped those behind me. Absolutely. I love your emphasis on leaving a legacy. Most definitely extremely important uh, to, carve a, to carve a path for those to follow behind you. Director Brathway, uh, same question for you. Um, was your decision to become a leader within the Black League community affected by your background? Um. I think for me, it, it really is an interesting journey and my journey is still continuing. Um, when I started, I'll be honest, I thought I wanted to be an attorney myself. So I had planned to attend law school, um, but I wanted to get an inside look at what it was like to work at a firm before I made that commitment. And for me, it really came in working in a firm setting that I decided, you know, I'm seeing what's happening here. The summer is the, the highlight of my year because I get to work with law students why not go into the schools and work with them? And it's there that I really found my niche in terms of wanting to give back to the students, like Dean Rougeau just mentioned, leaving a legacy, but really empowering the students to see what it is that they're being assessed on and what it is that they need to know going into these spaces so they can make the best impression and level the playing field for themselves. And that's really what I have been most passionate about in my career is understanding you know, what it is to be on the other side of the table, hear the conversations happening in the hiring committee meetings and really allowing students to know 
these are the things that are important to the firms. These are the things that you need to be aware of walking into the door and allowing them to feel empowered in, in themselves walking into these spaces and feeling as though they're not just being interviewed, but they're also interviewing potential employers to see if they feel like they are in a place where they belong and they can bring them their full selves to the company or to the organization and feel as though they're not just um, achieving professional goals, but also achieving personal goals and they can show up every day and be confident in who they are. So for me, it, it really is something that I have grown into, but I have become more and more passionate about it as I have um, advanced in my career. I love that. I love that um, your background came from, or your drive came from a firm background. Um, I've only, I have a very limited experience with firms as a 1L, but uh, when, when I have interviewed, I have noticed that stark a divide between, um, you know, just those that look like me or those that are diverse like me um, and their presence within the law firm. Um, so on that note, you mentioned that you're a major driver of what wanted to bring you back to law school um, to talk to other students um, was to show them how they can put their best foot forward when speaking with a law firm, um, especially considering their background. Could you tell a little, bit, a little more detail about what you mean by that? Sure. Um, so usually for me, it is a conversation, especially with uh, rising two L's, um, especially when I think about this particular part of my, my job, having that conversation with them about what does it mean to work in a firm? What does it mean to be a person of color? Where do you find your places of power? Who do you find it to be allies in these different places? You know, I think mentorship is a huge piece of it. But for a lot of 1Ls, you don't necessarily have a mentor walking in the door, but you need to know, you know, this is what you're evaluated on. This is the way that you have to present yourself. You know, the legal profession is very conservative. So I often steer them toward being conservative in their dress in terms of how they present themselves. You want to wear a suit. The finer points in, in, in terms of presentation and being your best professional self, I think are some things that, you know, as people of color, or first generation students, members of the LGBTQ community, um, we're not often um, taught coming into law school. So those are the finer points that I'd like to touch on in terms of preparing a student to go into those spaces and navigate them effectively so that you want to make sure that you leave a, a lasting impression that's a positive one on the people that you're meeting so that they can see you in the future being a part of their team and someone that they can go to. You know, as the associates often said at 3 a.m. if you have a deal to close, they want to be working in that conference room with you. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, extremely insightful. Thank you so much, Dr. Brothwaite, uh, Dean Rougeau. I have one last question for you, Dean Rougeau. Uh, just because um, I am, or the 1L or curriculum seems to be pretty strict across the country out of my own curiosity. Uh, what was your favorite class uh, of 1L and why? I, I think my famous favorite 1L class, believe it or not, was the one I thought was the hardest and the one I thought I would like the least, and that was civil procedure. Um, and it was not, and, and it was the class I ended up not really using as much because I didn't you know, go, go into litigation, but I just had a wonderful professor who just brought the subject, uh, you know, made it live. And you know, his passion for the subject, his passion for teaching, and you know his uh, ability to you know s get us to understand how important the system of civil procedure was to the to the legal system was just uh, a real inspiration. So I guess in a way I I tried to when I became a, a faculty member myself I, I often thought of him as a person I wanted to model myself. At. So it was a combination of the of the subject matter, discovering that sometimes things you don't like you will like, but also the person. Uh, who, who brought it to life. Absolutely. Um, I will say I had uh, Professor Broden for civil procedure and I will, the, uh, having a professor that really brings the subject to life, it definitely helps when it is so hard. <laughs> um, I'm sure as many others uh, students like me would agree, but um, uh, either way, thank you so much, uh, Director Rothway, Dean Nujo for joining me today uh, for this insightful conversation on diversity in our law school. Thanks for having us. I agree, thank you.